news starts right now. She was the first child buried after the Robb Elementary School shooting. Now 10 year old Amory Joe Garza's father is talking about what it was like to say goodbye to his baby girl. Our Lee Waldman is live now in Uvalde and Lee, you spoke with Amory's father at his home. He lives right near the school. How's he holding up? Well, he, he's not doing well. We, we sat with Alfred Garza inside of his living room next to a painted smiling photo of A. Marie. The same smile she had the morning of May 24th and the same smile her father will never see on her face again. Garza and A. Marie's stepmom, Viviana Granado, say she loved to play with anything that made a mess, whether it was slime or sand, she was happy. They both can't help but smile when thinking of her sass, saying she takes after her dad. Garza tells me he always wanted to be a dad since he was young. That's what he was meant to be. On May 10th, 2012, when Amory was born, he says he cried. She weighed five pounds, 11 ounces, just like he did. Two weeks after her 10th birthday, Amory was killed inside of Robb Elementary. Her funeral brought as many tears for Garza as her entrance to the world did. I mean, that's the best title I've ever had as, as father. You know, that's... You know, that was, that was, um, that, that's what I feel everybody's using for being is to, is to bring children into this world. I mean, honestly, I feel like that was, that's my entire reason for being was for her. He says moving forward, he's going to continue to live for a Marie because she can't live her life anymore. Coming up tonight on the night, we'll hear more from Alfred and also his calls for her death and the death of, of these other children and two teachers not to be in vain. Live in Uvalde, Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. Remember their names. Thank you, Lee. The community of Uvalde continues to say goodbye to the victims of that deadly shooting today. Eliana Garcia was laid to rest. Her family remembers her as a very outgoing and happy person, loved to dance, loved to play sports. Her father says she wanted to be a cheerleader. She loved making TikToks. She was about to turn 10 years old, but was already planning her quinceanera. A visitation was held today for Xavier Lopez. His mother was with him at the school during an award ceremony just hours before that shooting, not realizing that it would be the last time she would see him. He was eager for the summer to begin so that he could start swimming. His mother says that he was funny and he loved to cheer people up. The kids started um, asking out loud, uh, Mr. Reyes, what is going on? And I said, I don't know what's going on, um, but let's go ahead and get under the table, uh, get under the table and act like you're asleep. Um, as they were doing that, and I was gathering them under the table and told them to act like they were going to sleep, is about the time when I turned around and saw him standing there. Get under the table and act like you're asleep. A Rob Elementary teacher who was inside one of the adjoining classrooms targeted in that deadly massacre in Uvalde. Talking to ABC News, fourth grade teacher Arnolfo Reyes speaking to ABC's Amy Robach about that horrible day, what he did to help save his students and coming face to face with the gunman. We're going to have more of this exclusive interview on the night beat at 10 tonight. You can also see the full interview tomorrow morning on Good Morning America right here on KSAT 12. Canyon Lake EMS officials say a life vest, not enough to save a man from drowning over the weekend. That incident happened just after 430 between boat ramp 7 and Party Cove. Friends at the scene told officials the man was wearing a life vest when he got into the water because he didn't know how to swim. Then a friend told police they noticed he was face down in the water. Officials say this happened in the same area where they had reports of two near drowning incidents last weekend. Now, two homes on the west side are in ruins after flames broke out this afternoon. Nearly 30 fire trucks responded to the 3100 block of Neptune Street just after 12 p.m. Firefighters say the flames began on the property of a green home and then spread next door. Two vehicles and a shed were also affected. San Antonio Fire Chief Charles Hood saying that it was quick thinking that saved a woman who was trapped inside with her two grandparents. There was a granddaughter that was in the back bedroom. She was trapped in there by the smoke and the heat. She was able to push out the AC unit and escape out of the window. Uh, there was a dog in there with her. We're not really sure if that dog is survived this, probably not. Oh, boy. 
Also, look at that. It was super hot today. The heat obviously affecting those firefighters. Chief Hood was saying that they had more crews on the scene, which kept firefighters from getting overworked and dehydrated. Ram was here every night, regardless, selling Lone Star Tall Boys for a dollar and making a profit and just, he was a great guy. And they are murders that still reverberate through those that remember Taco Land. At 5 p.m., we heard from artists that used to play at the bar before the murder in 2005. Most people who frequently visited Taco Land remember the owner, Ram Ayala. In part two of our South Texas Crime Stories series, we take a look at the life of Doug Morgan, who was the doorman at Taco Land, who was also murdered before the robbery. Eric Hernandez has a look at the impact he had on the lives of everyone who knew him. That's, that's Doug right there. Doug was the sweetest guy. Pictures and memories are all Claude Morgan has left of his friend Doug Morgan. He would buy presents all year long for all his friends that had kids and he would take those presents on Christmas Eve and put them on their porch. He would wrap them all with comic paper. It was so beautiful. I miss him so much. The two met at one of Claude's shows. You see him walk around town in a newspaper hat. He's doing this and he's doing that. A fan of music, Doug would always go see Claude play. He would come to our show and he would do this crazy Doug dance in front of the band and uh, we just all love him. <laughs> Doug, for many years, was a doorman at Taco Land. He and owner Ramiro Ram Ayala were great friends. Doug would have done anything. He would have done anything for for uh, for Ram, and and vice versa. According to witnesses, the night of the shooting, Doug was shot as he attempted to save another coworker. Doug was a, a hero. Like apparently, he shot Ram first, and then he started to shoot Sunshine. And Doug pushed her down and he shot. While Denise Sunshine Coger was still hit, Morgan believes Doug pushing her down is probably what saved her life. Claude not surprised by that move as Doug always thought of others. A really good friend. And I miss him. His life and memory, one never to be forgotten. I'd like to be like Ronnie. That's that's pretty much it. Erica Hernandez, case at 12 News. Hey, coming up on the night beat tonight, one of the men convicted of capital murder in this deadly shooting sits on death row. For the first time ever, Joseph Gamboa speaks, telling our Eric Hernandez he was wrongfully convicted. That interview tonight on the night beat. All right, let's switch gears here. It's not just you. Gas prices have never been this high in San Antonio. Just take a look. We found gas going for $4.69 a gallon at one place. Average is $4.50. In just the past week, prices jumped 33 cents, and some drivers are only filling up half a tank at a time. How much does it cost you to fill up your Tahoe? $85.10. What do you think about that? It is crazy. It's just getting worse. It seems like it's not getting better. Yeah, not seems like he's right. Analysts say that supply is just not keeping up with booming demand. Much of the country is already paying $5 a gallon. Now, the question is whether we're going to pay that much here in San Antonio. The chief analyst for Gas Buddy tells us that it's not impossible. And if you're waiting for relief, that may not happen until the fall. I just keep waiting for the prices to go down yep. and they keep going the other way. All right, Trans Guide right now. This is 281 at St. Mary's and you can see heavy traffic both in and out of downtown. Very slow going. It looks like on the northbound lanes of 281, but traffic is moving. No major accidents or major things to tell you about construction. 281 in St. Mary's very busy. Well, new at 6 San Antonio, more than 6200 miles away from Ukraine. Yet right now, a company here in the Alamo City is saving Ukrainian lives. Courtney Friedman explains how soft tissue donations are helping the wounded soldiers and civilians in Ukraine. As the war in Ukraine rages on, soldiers and civilians are wounded daily. They have helmets, they have 
body armor, but their faces aren't protected, their limbs aren't that protected. Kevin Garfield is the president and CEO of Alamo Biologics, a tissue bank in San Antonio creating grafts used for wounds, eyes, dental care, and bones. These patches are used to stabilize that patient or that injury until they can get to a facility where they can get proper care and further care. About a month and a half ago, Barfield got a call from a consultant with iLife International, which facilitates eye tissue distribution worldwide. They're currently putting together tissue donations to be delivered to Ukraine. I said, absolutely. We're definitely on board. They're now sending out 556 tissue donations. These are the two types of donations that are heading to Ukraine. This one's so small you can barely see it. It's for eye injuries, and this one is skin for small wounds. The grafts are freeze dried in these big freezers, so they don't need to be refrigerated during delivery. We gathered up the tissue that they needed, packaged it, sent it over to Germany, where they had trucks going in to aid in a letter of gratitude to both organizations, the president of the Ukrainian Vitrio Retinal Society writes, you were the only one who provided a highly specialized humanitarian aid to Ukraine, essential for operations on patients with combat injuries. Proof that thousands of miles won't stop San Antonians from helping those in need. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Wow, love seeing that here. All right, now we're going to take a live look outside where, let's face it, it's better to be indoors when you're watching this shot here from our Southside City Cam because look at that, 103 degrees right now. Adam, this is no joke. You warned us about this last week, though. Yeah, it, this. I mean, we're going to keep stringing it together, triple-digit mm -hmm. days. It's just going to happen. You know, today, 103, that's our high temperature. That's a new record by two degrees. The old record, 101, set back in 2018. I do have an update here on this number in Del Rio. It says 108, but we just have a recent update, 109 which ties a record high temperature for the day in Del Rio. Catula made it up to 110. Most of us triple digits today. 103 right now. Temperatures down in the mid 80s by 10 o'clock. A bit of a breeze at least. We're going to talk about how hot it's going to be and even how hot it feels with the humidity in just a bit. New at six, the spread of a skin infection called monkeypox continues to surprise doctors and researchers. It's been around for years now. Some experts think it may have been confused with a sexually transmitted disease, so it stayed under the radar until now. Ursula Perry brings us up to date on how it spreads and why everyone, including apparently the medical community, needs to be informed. More than 700 cases outside of Africa, mostly among gay men, but anyone can get monkeypox. In fact, one heterosexual woman is among the U.S. cases under investigation now. The illness typically begins with flu-like symptoms and swelling of the lymph nodes, followed by a rash or sores on the face and body. Those lesions have fluid in them, and that has the virus in them, and it's also in the respiratory droplets. So what you want to do is if you have a lesion of some sort, you want to see a doctor right away. Cerise Roar Allegrini with the San Antonio AIDS Foundation wants to make sure, however, that people understand how it's spread. Monkeypox isn't in and of itself a sexually transmitted disease, but since sexual activity constitutes close contact, it could bring somebody in contact with those lesions. While the majority of patients in the U.S. and worldwide belong to the gay community, the risk is the same for anyone. And anytime you highlight a particular community that's at risk, you get stigma. Uh, and that's something that's really important to avoid. It's not limited to the gay community. We're just finding it in the gay population right now. And Dr. Brian Alsop does not want monkeypox to be confused with STDs, which could look similar. The thing is with monkeypox, that rash looks a lot like the same kind of rash you see with syphilis or with herpes or even with, um, you know, zoster infections. And so I think that's what they're trying to make people aware of. He also says pregnant mothers should be careful because of the effect the virus could have on them themselves as well as on the pregnancy. And those with skin issues like psoriasis, you can contract it through an open sore on your skin if you come in contact with an infected lesion. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. All right, now we're taking a live look. This is Sky 12 over the San Antonio Zoo where there is some sort of a drive through event going on right now. And this is an actual event. So if you want to go and check out the animals, it's the drive through Zoo that's uh, taking place right now. Great idea when it's 103 degrees uh, out. I, I was going to say a cool <laughs> way to see the zoo in yes. more ways than one out there. A drive through Zoo. Mm -hmm. 
perfect when it's 103 out there, Adam. That's the way to do it, if yeah. you ask me, if you're going to the zoo. They're always very creative at the zoo. That's one thing I love about them. And temperatures aren't going to decline in the days ahead. Not much. I mean, we're talking a degree or two here and there. Tomorrow, 102. Wednesday, Thursday, 101. Friday, 102. And I think even a little bit warmer into this upcoming weekend. Triple digits are here to stay for the foreseeable future. Now take a look at this. So far this year, we've had seven 100 degree days. The annual average is nine. I mean, we're just going to be way above average very quickly here. We've got this August like heat that's been hitting us in May and now June. Now you want to put into perspective the most 100 degree days we've had in a year. That was 59. That was back in 2009, 57 in 2011 and 41 in 2013. So to get into the top three, we got to hit about 42 and then we'll be in third place. We'll see how this summer pans out. But right now, no signs of the heat breaking. Currently 103, nothing but sunshine. You'd factor in the dew point of 63, that humidity in the air, and it makes it feel like it's a few degrees warmer than the actual air temperature. So it feels like 105 at the airport in town. It feels like 106 Castroville, feels like 108 in comfort. This is the heat index, of course, the calculation when you factor in the relative humidity and some subjective research along with that formula. But that's what we're, we're seeing for heat indices across our area, and I expect them to be just a little bit lower into tomorrow. Here's one reason why dew points this afternoon. They did drop a little bit, but not as much as usual. Dew points mostly in the low to mid 60s, so there's still a bit of humidity and mugginess in the air. But tomorrow, our dew point trend should actually fall off a little bit more. 7 a.m., yeah, oppressively humid. Dew point of 71. But then that drier air mixes down, and by the afternoon, a dew point closer to 60 degrees. So I think the feels like will be just a few degrees lower tomorrow than what we had today. Temperature wise, though, actual air temps, El Paso 101, 105 in Abilene. I mean, Phoenix, usually one of the hot spots right now at 104. Well, we're 103 in Junction, 106, 110 in Dryden. That's the official reading there. West on Highway 90, Oof. 108 Eagle Pass, Catula, 110. Not as hot closer to the Gulf Coast. That's where we have some higher humidity and then that humid air doesn't heat up as efficiently as some of the slightly drier air. But Helotus 102, New Braunfels 101, you get the idea. Hot everywhere and no real end in sight. Tomorrow morning, low to mid 70s. We'll be 75 here in San Antonio, some lower 70s in outlying areas. And then by the afternoon, the temperature map is going to look just like it does today. Castorville 104, Bernie, Bulverde about 100, and Floresville 102. And as we talked about, this trend continues, and I think the temperature actually goes up a little bit Saturday and Sunday, up to about 103, but that wouldn't even be record tying temperatures at that time. So I do foresee some records falling, but not over the upcoming weekend, at least not yet. Upper level high, the big blue H. We're very accustomed to this, especially this time of year. That's going to be dominating our sky keeping any storms away from us, keeping us sunny for the afternoons and pressing down on us, making it hot. At least we'll have a bit of a breeze. Southeasterly wind at 10 to 20 miles per hour this evening and through tomorrow. Nothing but sunshine, but about three days here. I think some records are in jeopardies in jeopardy in the over the coming week. All right, Adam, thank you. He's no longer in Houston. No, but still causing, well, he got another lawsuit filed against him. Yeah, we're Watson. number 24 now, and it's a very similar accusation as the other 23. When we come back, another lawsuit has been filed against now Cleveland Browns quarterback Deshaun Watson. And what a comeback by the fighting Texas Aggies in College Station last night. Coming up. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. A 24th lawsuit has now been filed against Cleveland Browns quarterback Deshaun Watson by another woman who claimed inappropriate sexual behavior during a massage. Originally, 22 women filed civil lawsuits against the former Texans quarterback, but now two more have been added since a story on real sports of Brian Gumble. In that interview, two women were upset with the Browns for guaranteeing Watson $230 million after giving up six draft picks to the Texans. After two grand juries decided not to indict Watson on any criminal charges, the NFL is still investigating the matter 
and could suspend or fine Watson for violating the league's code of personal conduct. After 50 years in coaching, including 39 in the NFL, Romeo Cronell announced his retirement today. He is one of the most decorated assistant coaches in the history of the NFL as part of 17 playoff appearances, winning five of the six Super Bowls he coached in with the Giants and the Patriots, spending the last eight seasons of his career with the Houston Texans. Here are his credentials with the Texans, including being the defensive coordinator, assistant head coach, associate, and then interim head coach, with that 73 was the oldest in NFL history, and then a senior advisor for football performance. Romeo Cornell did release a statement today in which he said, in part, football has been my entire life. It's been a dream come true to coach for 50 years. There are so many friends to thank who have helped me and supported me throughout my career. I would also like to thank my wife, Rosemary, and my three daughters, Lisa, Tiffany, and Christine, for all their support over the years. Because of their love and selflessness, I have been able to live out my dream. What a comeback last night by the fight in Texas Aggies to rally from being down 98, going into the top of the ninth, only to pull out the victory over TCU to advance to the Super Regionals. And what made it even sweeter for head coach Jim Schlossnagel was he used to be the head coach of the Horned Frogs for 18 seasons before he made the move to College Station for his first season. TCU had taken the lead 98, going into the top of the ninth, where the Aggies rallied to score seven runs, included the single with two outs, scoring two runs that would make it 12 to nine. The Aggies never looked back in the 15 to nine victory. They're headed to the Super Regionals for the first time in 2017. A very emotional moment for Schlossnagel after the game. I'm excited we won. I'm excited we were the team that won. But uh, I'm excited. To, I'm way more excited just to move on and congratulate TCU on a great season. Um, Big 12 champion and uh, what a ball game. You know, just what a ball game. Just when you think our guys can are going to give in, they don't. Uh, most resilient team I've ever coached and just an honor to be in the dugout with them. All right, congratulations. Like the fight in Texas Aggies, the Texas Longhorns are also headed to the Super Regionals, but in less dramatic style. It's after the Horns roughed up Air Force 10 to 1, jumping on the Falcons for five runs in the first inning. Ivan Melendez got the ball rolling, so to speak, with a two run blast for his 30th home run of the season. Dylan Campbell was also part of the offensive explosion, hitting two home runs to give the Longhorns 118 on this record setting season. And the Texas Longhorns softball team beat Arizona 5 to 2 after J.J. Smith gave Texas the lead with a three run blast last in the fourth inning and the Longhorns never look back right now the Longhorns have just started the semifinals of the women's college world series by facing Oklahoma State and we mentioned it a little bit at the five o'clock broadcast bring it back up again Jeff Trailer makes a cover of Texas football magazine Dave Campbell the editor of that and as a result we'll have more on that tonight on the night beat sounds good looking forward to it we're back in two minutes Coming up on KSAT Explains, we're going to take a look at the rise in gas prices, and we're also going to take a look at how it's affecting small towns and families. We're going to go to Tilden in the heart of the Eagle Fork and find out if we're in an oil boom or bust. surprise here gas prices keep climbing even right here in texas prices are really breaking records it all followed the u.s ban on russian oil prompted by russia's attack on ukraine and since then critics pundits and politicians have gone head to head over solutions yeah and one that keeps bubbling up drill more here at home but increasing the u.s oil supply and decreasing what it costs you to fill up your gas tank far more complicated in this week's case that explains myra arthur and david sears dive into what really determines gas prices and they start things off in a part of South Texas that was once at the heart of a drilling boom. It's been roughly 10 years since life took on a record setting pace here in Tilden, a small town 70 miles south of San Antonio. It was like the Wild West, it seemed like in the beginning. McMullen County Judge James Teal took office in 2011, right at the start of the surge in drilling in the Eagleford Shale. The Eagleford spans 20,000 square miles across 26 Texas counties from the Texas-Mexico border through counties east of Waco. From 2010 to 2015, McMullen County saw its taxable sales increase by 53 percent, more than double any other county in the Eagleford. Activity was, was instant with the people traveling to and from bigger communities to stay in hotels. 
every business, every everything was completely full. That includes Joe's Market. We carry everything, so you can get a fresh sandwich to a, a toilet bowl, you know, repair kit. A general store that's been family owned for over 100 years. But not even all that experience could have predicted the days of the Eagle Ford boom. It was exciting and scary both, not knowing what was to happen. Uh, if our town changed tremendously. We have a hotel now. Who would have thought Tilden America would have a hotel? We have a pilot, I mean, and we have a Valero just across the street from the pilot. We have, you know, two stoplights now. The additional funding from the drilling in the Eagle Ford, allowing McMullen County to have a 24-hour sheriff's department for the first time. We've been able to pave almost every road in the county. We're working on a streets and drainage project now. During the height of the boom here in McMullen County, they had 32 rigs going. Now they're down to three and you're looking at one of them. And the county judge did say that they're ready for a resurgence in this activity should that happen, but that is not a quick answer to these high gas prices. So when the price of, of oil goes up, the price of everything goes up. And that's something we're all experiencing. We're not just paying more for gas, but for everything. From milk to orange juice to medications, even the price of clothes and shoes is higher. Part of the reason oil is a huge part of our everyday lives. And that's part of the reason why energy inflation is so concerning, because we use oil not just in gasoline, but in household goods, in food production, um, just really, really across our economy and across our lifestyle. Uh, so many things are made from oil. The price hike finger inevitably gets pointed at oil companies. The price that you're seeing at the pump is a reflection of um, the in, typically independent business owner trying to get a return on the cost of purchasing fuel that they've made. According to the American Petroleum Institute, nearly 99% of gas stations are independently owned, although one company may own several stations. The owners sign a licensing agreement with oil companies to put their name on the marquee. Like any other business, the station owner has to buy the fuel, along with all the other items they sell. Plus, there are costs like labor and maintenance, all rolled into the price of doing business. They recoup some of those expenses by setting a price of gas, and that creates competition with the other guy on the corner. Prices are driven by market fundamentals and uh, by supply and demand principles. Uh, and also by competitive, the competitive marketplace. And the market for oil is a global one. What happens to the supply and prices around the world has an impact on us here at home. We're banning all imports of Russian oil and gas and energy. That means Russian oil will no longer be acceptable at U.S. ports. In March, President Biden announced the U.S. would ban oil imports from Russia after the country waged war on neighboring Ukraine. After that, we saw prices start to shoot up. But that price hike wasn't because the ban on Russian oil meant a drastically lower U.S. oil supply. The U.S. was only importing about 500,000 barrels of Russian oil a day, just a fraction of what the U.S. consumes per day, which is about 21 million barrels of oil. According to the American fuel and petrochemical manufacturers, only about 1% of our refined crude oil comes from Russia. It's the fact that on the global marketplace, Russia was such a large producer of oil. It produced more than 10 million barrels per day, the third largest producer of oil, the first, the largest exporter of oil in the world pre-invasion. So a drop in oil supplies in Europe, for example, a place that relies much more heavily on Russian imports than the US, can still drive up prices for us because it is a global marketplace. For the first time in history, prices are averaging above $4 a gallon in every state. Prices can jump just a few cents at a time. Or even here in San Antonio, they've been known to jump 20 to 30 cents overnight. One proposed solution, produce more oil here in the U.S. That's really the only way you're really going to bring down the price of crude and therefore bring down the price of gasoline. And that means diesel fuel as well. Bringing those prices down could bring down the price of goods and services across just about every industry. But drilling more is hardly an easy solution. It takes many years to explore, develop, to get additional permits for rights of way, for water take away capacity, for infrastructure that might be needed. 
Here in McMullen County, it's just much different than it was. There's not the boom town kind of atmosphere. But oil field traffic is picking up again. The once man camps, places where oil field workers stayed at the height of the Eagleford shale boom, are today hotels. And this one is nearly full for the first time in years. They're busy again, so it's good for local business owners. There are lessons learned from the first time around that folks here will keep in mind should an increase in oil field activity keep on trucking. Now that we know all the things, you know, we've decided who, who we may not get in bed with next time, you know, or what companies or, you know, just little things like that. Not so little are the benefits that Judge Teal says the county still sees from the Eagleford shale boom all these years. Years later. McMullen County has been able to also save dollars where we can and, and maximize the dollars that come in through tax revenue and been able to sustain a good fund balance and, and prepare for the days whenever things aren't so good. Now, there are certainly other energy sources outside of oil, but the price of gas is what's hitting our money hard right now. So that's why we chose to focus on gas prices in this episode. To find all our KSAT Explains episodes, just scan the QR code you see right here on your screen. That's going to take you to our website where you can check out all the topics we've covered so far. We'll be right back. It's summer, that means road crews hard at work on San Antonio roads from the east side to the west side. That means there are some closures to deal with. Traffic Authority Stephen Cavazos with the details for drivers who need to get around. It is a new month and of course we want to make sure that you plan your commute accordingly. There will be several, clo several closures that is taking place in our area. So let's go ahead and find out what's happening here along Loop 410 on the west side of San Antonio. We know a lot of work is taking place over there. So guys, just pack that patience because we're going to be seeing some painting operations. That is current right now, but this will be up until Monday, June 20th. It will be overnight, 8 in the evening to 5 in the morning. And during that time, drivers can expect alternating mainland closures in both directions from Marbach Road to Ingram Road. But the work continues as we take a drive up here to I-10 over on the east side of San Antonio bridge work. We know that has been current and ongoing. Uh, keep in mind that is from 8 in the evening to 5 in the morning. During that time, you can expect a full closure of the westbound main lanes from FM 1518 to FM 1516. Let's go ahead and take one last drive over here to Northwest Military Highway where utility work is taking place. That is current and should be wrapping up Friday, June 10th. Keep in mind that will start at 7 in the morning and should be wrapping at 6 in the evening. During that time, you can expect a single lane closure in both directions from Loop 1604 to Hebner Road. But of course, this information is on our website. Open your phone and scan this QR code that will take you directly to the KSAT traffic page and that should have the latest on all the closures that are taking place in your area and of course anything else that could impact that drive time. Now speaking of drive, we're going to tell you what's happening right now. Live cam here over 410 where you can see things are a lot calmer out there by the airport. Really not much to talk about. Traffic is flowing smoothly and it's sunny out. Yeah. Very sunny. <laughs> and the AC's cranked up and yeah. if you don't have one of the shades in your windshield and you're parked outside all day, ooh, you'll definitely feel the heat inside that car. High temperature just got updated. 104. We just recently hit 104, just uh, I'd say about 15 minutes ago. So the new record high for the day, 104 beating the old high by three degrees set back in 2018. That's officially here in San Antonio. Del Rio, an update as well, 110. Hondo topped out at 106. Catula, 110. Not quite as hot closer to the Gulf Coast line. Right now, temperatures are still around the century mark. Officially at the airport, 103. By 8 o'clock, still mid-90s, 10 o'clock, mid-80s. And I do think we'll cool into the low to mid-70s by early tomorrow morning. Talk about the heat index, the wind, if we get any relief, at least from a bit of a breeze, and some record-challenging heat, even more of it, on the way. I certainly the talk of the town. 103 reasons to mm. stay inside. Mm hmm. Muy caliente. Just. Yes, but Adam, well, you told us about this last yeah. week. I mean, we're prepared. I always say my favorite uh, place this time of year is the uh, meat section at H E B with the open refrigerators. You know, the brisket. Perfect. The, yeah. The dino ribs. Oh, <laughs> I'm, now I'm dreaming about two things, two beautiful things at once. You could also do that at the produce section. 
I'm just yes, saying. You, you can, you can. But it doesn't have the same allure for you, I realize. Exactly. For me, it's all about the, <laughs> it's all about the protein section. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it, it feels good in the air, air conditioning, obviously. Seven 100 degree days so far this year. To put that in perspective, you know, we're just into June. We've had seven 100 degree days. Typically in a given year, on average, we have nine. Obviously, we're going to be way above average in terms of triple digit days for the year. More records are in jeopardy. I think three of them are in jeopardy over the coming seven days. And that just I mean, triple digit heat continues is basically what that goes to. Now, let's put this into perspective a little bit when it comes to consecutive 100 degree days. We're projecting about 10 in a row. If we can get up to 12, we would be in the top four in terms of uh, record consecutive 100 degree days in a row. So we're expecting to break about top five, uh, at least on record here on the list. But the most we've had in a row is 21 consecutive 100 degree days. And we'll see what the future brings us, but no big break from the heat in sight anytime soon. Unless you go to the produce aisle or to the refrigerated section. 103 right now. Dew point is 63, so it feels like it's 2 degrees warmer than the air temperature. I anticipate these dew points to drop a little bit more tomorrow. And so the feels like temperature is being a few degrees lower, just 1 or 2 degrees lower. Here's a bit of relief. Gusty winds. I mean, at times we're seeing gusts between 20 and 30 miles per hour. Hondo gusting to 22, Converse 21, New Braunfels gusting to 30 miles per hour. We're periodically seeing those gusts, which is at least a little bit of relief from the intense heat that we're dealing with. We'll continue to see gusts through the night and into tomorrow between about 20 and 25 miles per hour. So the breeze, at least, we're going to have that through the night and even throughout the day tomorrow. But the remainder of the week, the end of the week and into the weekend, I don't anticipate as much of a nice breeze out there to move that air around. Across the state, we're all feeling the heat. Abilene 105 now, Midland 103, Junction 106, Del Rio 109, Dryden 110, along with Catula at 110 and a little bit lower as you get to the Gulf Coast. This is typically the scenario. Corpus Christi 87 in Victoria now at 90. Readings locally. Stinson on the south side, 105. Port SA on the west side, 103. Castroville nearby, 106. Triple digits and it's just going to continue. Tomorrow morning we'll start the day in the low to mid 70s. So 73 in Holotus, 75 in San Antonio and Floresville. And we'll start the day at 73 in Comfort. By the afternoon, not comfortable necessarily. We're going to be triple digits above 100. South side, west side of town, about 104. You get to the north side of town, uh, closer to 102. Even Bulverde, Bernie, 100 degrees. Sabinal, Uvalde, 106. This trend continues, and there will be three days here where I think records will be in jeopardy. And it's actually not Saturday and Sunday when the record highs are 103. All right, taking a look at our satellite and radar. Obviously, quiet. We just have the sunshine. We'll have the typical low clouds early in the morning with that southeasterly wind off the Gulf of Mexico, but that's just late at night, very early in the morning. Otherwise, Big Blue H is dominating. It's going to center itself even more right overhead, press down on us, deflect any showers or precipitation away from us. The high, well, of course, that always means the dry conditions and the high always wins as well. It will move off to the west a little bit this weekend. Could open the door for a disturbance or two, but I just don't foresee any disturbances headed our way. So tomorrow morning at 7 a.m., mostly cloudy and 75. Then by 10 a.m., we're sunny and 83 degrees, noon 93. And then a high temperature tomorrow, we think in San Antonio, of about 102, maybe 103. That would be between about 4 and 5 p.m. Records likely to f be t tied or broken Wednesday at 101 and then Friday at 102 and then even next Monday a week oh. from today oh. at 102. <laughs> it's all relative to what the record is, but bottom line, it's going to be hot. Of course, that is a forecast packed with triple digits. Mm -hmm. There's no way to get used to it. Sorry, no. in case you missed it coming up next. Now we're going to get you caught up on anything you missed today. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. It's Monday, June 6th. The kids started um, asking out loud, uh, Mr. Reyes, what is going on? A Rob Elementary teacher who was inside one of the adjoining classrooms targeted in that deadly massacre in Uvalde 
Talking to ABC News, fourth grade teacher Arnolfo Reyes speaking to ABC's Amy Robach about that horrible day, what he did to help save his students and coming face to face with the gunman. I said, I don't know what's going on, um, but let's go ahead and get under the table. Uh, get under the table and act like you're asleep. I turned around and saw him standing there. Now two homes on the west side are in ruins after flames broke out this afternoon. Nearly 30 fire trucks responded to the 3100 block of Neptune Street just after 12 p.m. Firefighters say the flames began on the property of a green home and then spread next door. Parents who are still searching for baby formula could be in luck soon. This weekend, Abbott Nutrition said it restarted production at its Michigan plant. The company says some products should hit store shelves by June 20. That Michigan facility is the plant that was closed by the FDA after they found some bacteria that could be deadly to infants. The support for victims of Uvalde continues to pour in. A local benefit concert was a huge success. iHeartMedia put on the Uvalde benefit concert at Cowboys Dance Hall last night. Country artists like Russell Dickerson, Easton Corman, and Kevin Fowler performed in front of a packed crowd. Over $138,000 was raised. All the money be given will be given rather to the First State Bank of the Valley, which goes directly to the victim's families. It's been a pleasure having you with us. We'll see you back here on the Night Beat at 10. Till then, have a great night.